Okay, hi everyone. Um, welcome to our 65th session of Med AI Group Exchange. This week, we have Julian Costa from Red AI here with us to speak about challenges and opportunities in multimodal biomedical AI. Julian was trained as a neurologist at the Flanny Institute at Argentina before joining Yale University as a postdoc fellow in 2019 where his research focused on population genetics and advanced neural imaging in neurovascular disease. He has also collaborated with Dr. Raj Pokas, Med AI Lab on multiple projects related to the application of AI in healthcare. He currently works as a clinical data scientist at Red AI Inc. Thank you, Julian, for joining us today. Before we start, could you tell us your preference on when you want to take questions? Um, I'm okay with when I think maybe maybe it's best to to keep it give them for them. But uh, if anyone wants to to speak up, also I'm, I'm okay with it. Um, okay, sounds great. So let's try to make this session as interactive as possible. Without further ado, let me hand it over to Julian. Okay. Uh, so thank you for the invitation and hi to everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to to be here and to present uh, our work. Uh, so th this this paper is actually uh, a review article that was uh, published a few months ago uh, and was basically uh, like mentored by Dr. Rajpuhar and Dr. Eric Topol. Um, and basically, the idea is to discuss the opportunities and the challenges of using multimodal. Uh, data uh, to develop uh, AI in, in, in biomedicine. Uh, so just to start uh, for disclosures, I'm currently an employee at AI as, as was mentioned, um, but the work to be presented here was done before I joined Red AI and the company was not involved at any step. Uh, so when we talk about multiple modalities in, in healthcare AI, uh, we basically are referring to the fact that the human, like human data and like biological data in general, is is inheriting multimodal. So as you can see in the figure that is, I I recognize, it's a bit confusing from the from our paper. Um, we have very different dim dimension of of data that we, we can obtain from from people or from from organisms in general. So we have omics data, including genomics. Uh, we have metabolomics data, immune status, biomarkers, microbiome. We have data from electronic health records, which include, includes a lot of different types of tabular data, but also uh, clinical notes. And we have imaging data uh, from different types of imaging modalities. We have data that we can obtain from wearable sensors like smartwatches. Uh, we have data we can obtain from ambient sensors. And of course, we can also have data obtained from the environment where people live and also the social determinants of health that uh, each people is, is subject to. Um, and on the other hand, we have a lot of opportunities or different things, different applications where um, multiple modalities can actually make an impact into improving the algorithms or the way we make decisions today uh, in healthcare. So a few of the opportunities that we mentioned in our review paper are um, mentioned here, which are precision health, digital clinical trials, uh, the hospital at home, pandemic surveillance and outbreak detection, um, digital twins, and uh, ultimately also like a virtual health coach. Uh, so in, in this presentation, I'm just going to go over a few of, the, of these different opportunities and, and explain what, what they are and what are the, actually the opportunities that we can uh, use multimodal data for in these cases. So I'm gonna start with um, precision health. Uh, and I first want to, to like just explain what we understand by, by precision health or precision medicine, uh, because the concept that has been like mentioned a lot without actually explaining uh, what it is. So. To give you a sense of what we do as, as doctors uh, in, in clinical practice, we basically 
see each one of the patients and we try to make the, the best decisions based on different studies or different guidelines that are published in, in the medical literature. And these guidelines are, are, are usually uh, just a summary of the available evidence from clinical trials and observational studies that basically are just an average um, kind of condensation of the evidence uh, for a group of patients. But of course, this average does not always work for each individual patient. So even though some medication may work for 30 or 40% of patients with a particular disease, there are a good proportion of patients for which uh, this medication won't work, for example. And even then, the clinical trial that tested the medication will yield a positive result, for example, because a good proportion of the patients actually responded. So what the job of, of doctors is in clinical practice is to try to look at the patient one uh, by one and, and actually take into account all the different data that we have for the patients to decide whether actually this medication that is suggested by a clinical guideline, for example, is actually going to benefit this patient. Uh, but of course, we want in the future to make this more data-driven and more precise. So that's why what we mean by precision uh, medicine, the idea that we can leverage the um, large amount of like very granular data that we can obtain from patients to actually make decisions uh, that are beneficial for, for, for our patients. And to do that, what when we refer to precision medicine in general in the in the literature, we're usually talking about some kind of OMS. And the OMS are basically, uh, this is started with the genome, of course, but it has expanded to many other OMS, uh, quote unquote, uh, like for example, the epigenome, the transcriptome, the proteome, the metabolome, the microbiome, the exposome, et cetera. So um, that this is kind of the, the the field or the context where you're going to listen or hear about precision medicine more in, in general. Um, so many of these OMS or genomics, for example, had already been shown to improve in different studies, uh, different at different tasks in, in clinical practice. For example, there are many different genetic markers that are used, for example, in cancer to predict whether a patient is going to respond or respond to a particular therapy right now. And there are also like more and more polygenic risk scores, which are just a summarization of how is the genetic background of a person influences the risk of a particular disease, uh, can be used also to stratify patients that are going to, and then decide whether these patients are going to benefit from particular medications. Like for example, statins to lower the cholesterol, or PCHK9 inhibitors, which are another medication for, for cholesterol lowering. So in particular, other different kinds of OMS are also shown by themselves uh, that are very useful. But what hasn't been done, at least widely to date, is to com combine all the different OMS. And there are many challenges with combining uh, all these different kind of data in, in patients. And, of course, one of the challenges that you can encounter is that, for example, there are some of these uh, layers of data, like the genome, that are static, like mostly static, I would say. Uh, but this genetic information is usually passed on when, when, when at conception, the genetic information is, is uh, given to, to the person, and then that usually in general doesn't change. Uh, but other information like the transcriptome, the proteome, and the epigenome are things that change throughout life and are very dynamic. Uh, so for example, the proteome, the transcriptome can change just in a matter of, um, for example, the time of day and, and disease states, for example. Uh, so it's very, it's a challenge in general just to try to combine on how, do we, do, what kind of, different models we use to combine the, this data. Um, and there are a few examples of studies that have been done today to try to uh, do this. Um, 
the first I, one one side I, I'd like to mention is just one side that we mentioned in, in the review, which is basically just an in on one study. They just follow one particular patient and they look at the polygenic risk score of this patient. So they look at the at the genetic risk of developing the disease that the patient has a higher risk of develop, developing diabetes. And then they follow the patient through their, their, their life. And at some point with an infection, the metabolomics, the transcriptomic, the protomics, so they all other all, all omics data started to change and the patient uh, eventually developed diabetes. So the idea is that if we can gather this data for multiple patients, we may be able to find biomarkers that can predict at some point in time where this patient is going to develop a disease or not. And maybe we can act before it happens. Um, another example here uh, on the right, this paper that actually was published after, uh, after the review, but uh, I, I found it very interesting. So I, I wanted to bring it up here, which is uh, a study where they looked at lung cancer patients and they used different modalities of data also to train a model to predict response to a particular immunotherapy. So they use clinical data, they use data from images, and they use genomic uh, information from the tumors to, and they combine all this data and just develop, uh, train a model to, to predict response to therapy. So you can imagine uh, predicting whether a patient is going to respond to, to a particular treatment is very important in, in clinical practice. And while this kind of uh, this kind of multimodality or integration of, of multiple streams of data in particular is has been like been discussing for cancer patients for a while already, it's much less common for other diseases that are not uh, cancer, basically. So one of the studies that was also published uh, recently actually looked at uh, patients with Alzheimer's disease or other kinds of dementia. And they use a multi-omics um, combination integration of data, and they use it for, for two different things. One of the things is to try to predict the trajectory of the disease in these patients. And the other, the other was to try to stop categorize, uh, categorize these patients into different, in the, into different groups. Uh, with good results. So um, there are many examples of the usage of multiple uh, modalities, in particular multiple omics, to try to predict uh, the patient uh, uh, prognosis or the patient stratification who can help be, be helpful in different ways, like in clinical practice or to uh, conduct different clinical trials, focusing on particular subtypes, for example. Um, so these are like with this, uh, let's move on to the next uh, opportunity that we discuss on, on the paper, which is digital clinical trials. And to explain a bit like digital clinical trials just means the usage of digital technologies in the setting of a clinical trial. So uh, you, you would probably know clinical trials are a size that are in general very costly in an economic way, but also they are all very time consuming. So anything that we can do to try to reduce this, this cost uh, is going to help. So digital technologies have been used for, for multiple things so far, like for consenting of the patient, for recruiting of the patient, uh, but where does multimodality come into play in this? Well, there are, many things that where multimodal data can help. Uh, one of the things that can be used is to use wearable sensors, for example, like smartwatches to try to obtain data from these patients without having to send a particular person to uh, check the, the, vital, the vitals of the patient, for example. Um, and of course, also the development of biomarkers using machine learning models. So for example, if we can use multiple streams of data from biosensors, from ambient sensors, et cetera, to uh, 
subgroup different kind of patient, we can then use what is called an adaptive clinical trial design to understand which patients are going to most likely benefit from a particular intervention and just focus on those, those patients for the trial, for example. So uh, these legal clinical trials are also an, a very uh, appealing opportunity for the use of, of multimodal data in, in medicine. Another important area where multimodality uh, can be helpful is for what we, we call the hospital at home in the review. Uh, but it's basically the idea of remote patient monitoring. So as you probably know, uh, being a hosp hospitalized is not without consequences. So patients that are hospitalized are at higher risk of nosocomial infections, for example. Um, they are usually away from their family members or away from the support from family members. And of course, being hospitalized is also uh, very expensive. So if we could find a way of reducing these uh, costs by having the patients uh, being monitored at their home, uh, this, this could be have a, a great impact in, in general in healthcare. So there are many different technologies that have been tested and, and is be, are being developed for uh, remote patient monitoring. Uh, of course, the two main things that uh, we look at here are wearable sensors and ambient intelligence. Wearable sensors, as, as you know, are and it's not cucumber like the smart watches that track your heart rate to your respiratory rate. Uh, can track temperature some too. They can also look at the uh, electrocardiogram, the latest uh, version of, of, of these smart sensors. They can also look at the oximetry in the latest uh, versions too. And for ambient intelligence, it's basically any kind of sensor that can be uh, set up in the environment. Like for example, cameras, or if you want to be more careful with, with privacy depth camera or infrared cameras, for example, or we can also set, uh, set up microphones. And as you can see in the figure, the idea is that using all these streams of data, we can, for example, predict first how the patient is, is doing from a clinical perspective, the patient is, the, the vitals of the person are, are not looking good. Is that something that we we'll probably want to pay attention? But we, we can also like predict the, activities that the patient is doing right now. So if the patient is sleeping, if the patient is walking, if the patient is walking with assistance, um, if the patient has a, a fall, for example. And there are studies where uh, it's been shown that using, using more than one modality uh, is, is helpful in many cases. Like for example, to predict falls, uh, it's better to have, for example, depth cameras and a microphone that just one of the, of the two modalities. Another uh, one of the opportunities where multimodality can be helpful is uh, pandemic surveillance and outbreak detection. So uh, just to, to give an, an example of outbreak detection, there, there has been a couple of studies that uh, have been done by the Scripps Research, which is uh, where Dr. Topol uh, worked and, and leads the, the research teams there, uh, where they show that using data from smart, smart watches and sometimes self-reported data from, from symptoms of, from the patient, they can first predict where, when an outbreak of influenza like this is, uh, is going to happen and sometimes also even predict the diagnosis of COVID in, in a recent paper uh, from, from this group. Um, but of course, you can also use uh, multi, multiple modalities for different kinds diagnosis and prognosis of these different diseases, uh, like COVID, for example. And in a paper, for example, they use it for social distance monitoring. Uh, and in this paper, they show that uh, here is in, in the left, they show using just one modality, just the, the, video, the, the image part, and then using more than one modality, using also uh, audio and, and infrared cameras they can predict actually the, the more accurately the number of persons so they can predict where there is a violation of social distance uh, regulation, for example, or when there are free groups uh, of, of people standing. 
so this this can be helpful. This uh, I recognize can be a, li a little bit controversial depending on where you stand on on privacy and, and stuff because you're uh, using uh, AI to monitor people. Uh, but in this case, it's at least for 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 a good reason, which is the idea that uh, we we need to social distance where there is a pandemic. Um, then uh, an interesting thing that uh, is a concept that is not uh, super well known, but uh, it, it's very interesting, although we're still in the early stages in, in medicine of, of this, is the concept of digital twins. The concept of digital twin is basically the idea of just developing a model that ends up being just a simulated version of something. Uh, so this has been done in, in the aerospace in engineering industry, for example. Uh, but in the setting of healthcare, the idea of digital things uh, is that we can simulate basically a patient and how the patient will respond to particular intervention, how the patient will, will respond uh, to part. So for example, to different uh, diseases or different medications, etc. So of course, for the development of these digital twins, the more data that we have, the, the more multiple modalities of data we have, the idea that probably the, these digital twins will be much more uh, precise and much, much more accurate to predict actually what a patient uh, with these characteristics will, um, would uh, respond. So this is something that, uh, as I say, is in the early stages, but there are some companies actually that are already uh, doing and commercializing this. Uh, one of these companies is, is Unlearn, uh, that AI. Uh, so basically the idea is to use this for to augment clinical trials. So basically you create uh, a digital twin of a particular disease. And then when you randomize patients in a clinical trial, you use these digital twins as pair controlled for, for subjects. So in the end, in the clinical trial, you end up enrolling uh, patients that are going to receive the intervention. And many, instead of doing a one-on-one -on -one, uh, randomizations where you, you enroll one patient for the intervention arm and one patient for the control arm, you will draw much more patients on the, the actual intervention arm uh, and supplement the control group with digital twins. So this is something that uh, it's of course uh, very des desirable if, if, if it's accurate. Uh, so it is it's a promising thing to look uh, out for in, in the future. And of course, ultimately, what we would like uh, in the future is to have a virtual health coach. And this, this idea was already proposed by uh, Dr. Topol in 2019 uh, in, in this review. Uh, and just, just, just for, a, for a little bit of context here, um, around, I think around 30% of, of persons in, in the US have uh, an Alexa device. So the idea is, and, and the ones that don't, don't have an Alexa device, Alexa are similar, right? I'm not advocating for Amazon here. Um, uh, the ones that don't have a, a, an Alexa or similar device, they, they have their cell phone where they also have a, a smart, a smart uh, assistant, basically. So what we envision at least, or, or what we think uh, about the future is that if we can have a virtual health coach that can answer questions about any sort of medical question that you have or, or how to deal with a particular symptom that you're having this day or how to follow up uh, for a particular disease, uh, that will basically help a lot in, in the general sense of how things work in medicine because many of the, the, the consultations that are done, uh, done for, for, for doctors are just basically uh, normal follow-up questions from patients 
um, which take a lot of like time and effort from the health system. Um, so the more data that we can manage to integrate to be able to train models that will fit this virtual health coach, of course, the more accurate these virtual health calls uh, will, will be. Um, right now, there are a few applications that uh, are sort of, sort of virtual health coach, coaches for narrow, uh, like this is spaces like just for, for example, just for diabetes or just for, for hypertension and the management of, of those diseases. But the idea is that with time, we want to have something that is more generalizable that can basically take you information about your risk for different diseases from your genetic risk for different diseases and take into account uh, the medications that you're taking, how you're sleeping, how is your physical activity going. And if you ask a question about your blood pressure, they can answer, okay, do this or ask your doctor about this medication, certain this medication and the, this, this kind of stuff. So uh, of course, this is looking into the future, uh, but this is something that we think uh, is, is possible. Uh, we're probably not there yet from, from a technical perspective, uh, but it's something to, to, to at least try to uh, work for. But uh, th those are kind of the opportunities that we had in mind. Um, of course, to be successful in developing AI models that can help with these opportunities, uh, we need to tackle some ch challenges. And the, the first thing that, of course, we need to do is gather data, right? Um, so right now, there are a few studies, large studies that have data from multiple modalities. Uh, and these are listed in, in, in our paper, in, in table one of our paper. Uh, but just to mention a few, one that I think has, has contributed a lot to the scientific community is the UK Biobank, which is study done in the UK that enrolled more than 500,000 participants and had a wide variety of data, including questionnaires, electronic health records, clinical data, laboratory data, genetic data of different forms, genome-wide you know, you know, genotyping, whole exome and whole genome sequencing, and imaging uh, data, for example. And they also have metabolites and, and proteomics uh, right now. I think they're, they're I, don't, I don't know if they're already released the proteomic, but if not, they're going to release it soon. Um, so this, this study has, all, has already, I think, uh, be the foundation for more for thousands of, of, of publications. Um, but of course, there are limitations to, to, to this data. For example, the imaging data is not available for all participants. And the imaging data that we do have, for example, for brain MRI, which is something I, I work on, uh, is mostly for generatively health generally healthy people. So we don't have a lot of neuroimaging for patients with neurological diseases, for example, which limits that the kind of things that you can do with the data. Uh, but it still, it's, it's a very uh, helpful resource. Um, there are similar uh, data sets done in, in other countries like the China Calorie Biobank, the Biobank Japan. Uh, and in the US, there's the Million Veteran Program, which enrolled 1 million participants. There's TopMed. And recently, there is the All of Us Research Program, which is one of the, the more novel ones, uh, I'd say. Uh, and the, the, the good thing about the All of Us Research Program is that, uh, uh, in addition to being multi-modality, multi of course, uh, including genomic data, laboratory data, and uh, electronic health record data, they also have social determinants of health, and they focus on enrolling participants from underrepresented groups. Uh, so underrepresented groups from a race ethnic perspective, but also from economic, education or perspective, uh, from sexual identity and, and sexual orientation, uh, from age, the age perspective, um, from insurance perspective. So uh, that's that's a good thing because as, as you, you may know in the medical literature, a lot of the research output is focused 
in uh, particular in a particular populations, uh, so it's not very diverse. So the, the focus of this research program is to actually try to go a little bit against that and try to uh, recruit participants from from underrepresented uh, groups. Uh, they they also have wearable data I forgot to mention uh, for a few participants, few thousand, um, but they are still enrolling, so uh, there is still time to to add more data to to. The only thing that so far they don't have imaging data, which is uh, kind of bad, but uh, hopefully it's something that they may add in the future if they have access to the electronic health record. Um, there are also other, other studies, including studies from private uh, entities like the preservation and from, from Berlin, uh that aim to, to get data uh, from multiple modalities. But of course, many of the things that are being developed are uh, from data set are proprietary, so we don't we don't have access to. And now to talk about the technical challenges, and I, I am assuming everybody here is probably much more versed in these things than than I am as uh, uh, here. So I, I'm going to talk about them, uh, but do, you can then discuss uh, and tell me what you think. So for multimodal learning, uh, there are Many ways to to classify what what we mean by multimodal learning, uh, but there is a, a good survey paper that uh, basically divides multimodal learning into five different tasks that can be done. Uh, one is representation learning, re representation. Then there was alignment, the other is fusion, the other is translation, and then the final one is co-learning. So representation means the idea of um, either creating a joint representation of two modalities. So using two modalities as inputs and creating just one representation, one indirect effect from that modality, or having a coordinated uh, representation, which is kind of a, the concept that we use with contrastive learning, the idea that we can have one modality and the other modality, and we try to create one rep one vector representation uh, that is that what you input either the text, for example, or the images, the representation that you get is fairly similar. Um, so that's what, what the, the, the task of representation. Then the, there's the task of alignment, which is, I think, more easy to understand with, with an example, which is the idea of having what matches each part of one modality to the other. So for example, if we're, we're talking about the video, the idea is that we can um, if we have in and out in the audio in text the represent the, the description of what's happening in a video, the idea is to try to align what is being talked in the audio or describing the text with what happens in the images in the video. Um, then the task of fusion is like as the, the the one that is more straightforward, which is the idea of just combining different modalities to solve an inference problem to predict something. Uh, translation, which is just basically uh, converting from one modality to another. And co-learning, uh, which is a little bit more complex, but it's the idea of using one modality to kind of teach the other one. So for example, if you have two modalities, but in, at inference time, so we, when you're trying to predict something, you only have, you're only, only have, going to have information for one of them, uh, but you know that the other one is much more Rich in information, you can basically use two of them at training time so that the like helper modality can help the like not that help for modality learn uh, about the relationship with the outcome. And then at inference time, you only use uh, the, the, the modality that you have available. So, different, of course, this is not comprehensive, and there are many more things that you can do with multiple multi modalities, but it's kind of the a general framework of uh, whether different tasks that you can solve with multimodality. Um, and right now, we don't have answers for the architectures that we can use for um, multimodal machine learning in, in biomedicine yet. There are a few attempts that have been made. Like, for example, this paper actually was published uh, a few uh, uh, weeks or months ago, which tried to implement what, what is a unifying framework of how to deal with multimodal data in medicine. And they use a very well-known data set from the medical space that you probably 
most of you already know, which is Mimic. Uh, they use the, the latest version, Mimic 4. Uh, and they basically constructed many different models and run different iteration of using different uh, kind of combination of modalities using tabular data from data time series from events, laboratory measurements, vitals, et cetera, uh, nodes uh, and images, of course. And they try to predict different things. They try to predict different diseases in, um, in like chest, chest diseases. And they try to predict mortality and they try to predict um, uh, whatever, the uh, length of stay. So they run, I think more than 10,000 different, different models for this. And they show that multimodal data uh, is in general better for, for some of the tasks, uh, but not for all of them. Um, but it, it, it was a, it's a very interesting paper to read because of how, how cleanly they, they handle the, the way of integrating all this data. So basically they just had one particular feature structure for each type of data. So they have pre-trained models for each uh, type of data. And then they just created a vector representation of each modality and then concatenated the last uh, one to, to use for, for the final prediction or the final model. Um, so, um, but of course the, the not so good part about using an approach like this, which is uses one particular feature structure for each modality is you, that you have to train uh, and use the expert knowledge to train in each one of the, the feature structures. So what we would like in the future is to actually have a more generalizable way of handling this. And this is something that we mentioned a bit in the review, uh, which is the idea of the new, the, the more novel architecture that are being published in the, in the last few years um, for handling of more and more generalizable multiple modalities. So for example, the perceiver architecture uh, and the Gato architecture, uh, which try to create models that can be used for multiple modalities uh, without actually having any kind of different uh, kind of modality specific um, pre-processing, uh, let's say. So this, two kind of models is what we think in the future may help uh, with multimodal uh, AI in healthcare. The idea that we can just input the different modalities into uh, a model without having to then do a lot of pre-processing steps. And another architecture that we think it's it's very likely to to lead to to advances in the in the future is graph uh, machine learning. So as you can imagine in healthcare in general, a lot of the things are very interconnected and, and hierarchical in the world they're connected. So many of the things are very amenable to be, uh, to be uh, a structure in a data structure like graphs. So there's a very beautiful review that was published in Nature Biomedical Engineering uh, relatively recently way where they go over the different kinds of uh, graph machine learning uh, um, frameworks, I would say, uh, and the different applications um, in biomedicine and the different uh, options that, that can be used for, for medicine. So I invite you to, to read it uh, because it's, it, it's, it's very informative. Um, so yeah. Other technical challenges, uh, that is arise with the idea of multimodality. One of them is the curse of dimensionality uh, that you might be aware of, but just as an example of this uh, in a very like simple figure is if we only have one dimension or one modality, let's say uh, in this case, it's one variable related to uh, patients with that are healthy or have my cognitive impairment, uh, you can see that the data set blind spots where you, we don't have information, we have, don't have any patient in the training data uh, are 
like very small and you can still kind of make a classifier that divides the patients like around here, for example, if you, you can see my mouse pointer. Um, so what happens is if you have more than one dimension, this is uh, a little bit more noticeable. The, the DSM blind spot becomes very, very big. So you don't have many uh, participants in this, this part of the data space. Uh, so if you want to train a classifier, the classifier may well look like this or look like this. So while for the data points that we do have, the classifier will still perform relatively the same uh, for the patient that would end up falling in this data set blind spot at the time of inference, uh, the classifier can do two, the two different classifiers can do very differently in, in these patients. So you can, you can imagine that as you um, increase the number of dimensions, this problem only gets bigger. And the only way to, uh, to really, really solve the problem is to have more, more patients, which is uh, very difficult in general or costly in, in the setting of, of biomedicine. And this is like a good transition to what I was going to mention uh, there, which is the, the challenge of, of data in healthcare. Uh, so this, this is a, a very nice paper which mentioned the different types of access uh, that uh, health data has. So of course, one of the access is number of participants and this is, uh, there's usually a trade-off between number of participants that you enroll in a patient, in a patient in a study, and the depth of the phenotyping of these participants. So for example, for studies like the UK Biobank or studies like the all of research programs, they have a, a large amount of patients, uh, like 500,000 or more patients. Uh, but the depth of phenotyping is uh, limited. So most of these studies, what they use is, for example, billing codes uh, from the electronic health record to determine if the patient had a disease or not. They also have questionnaires, uh, but they are more difficult to, to ascertain disease from, from them. Where the ideal way to have depth of phenotyping will be like a combination of uh, manual labeling, for example, from clinicians that know exactly what the patient had, right? So a, a good example that I, I like to uh, use to when we talk about depth of phenotyping is uh, in a stroke. So for a stroke, for example, you can say that the patient has a stroke, or you can say, and there is an ICD code that is very useful, I guess, uh, which is just stroke, and you don't have any more information about that. Uh, I see the code is just the billing code to to codify particular diseases. Um, so, but then you can have ischemic stroke, which happens when uh, a clot basically occludes uh, one artery, and you the, the, a particular area of the brain doesn't get enough uh, blood supply, so the, that part of the brain is is uh, like suffering ischemia, or you have a hemorrhagic stroke, which happens when a blood vessel ruptures and bleed into the brain. And within each one of those ischemic and hemorrhagic strokes, we also have in, in different subtypes of ischemic stroke and different subtypes of hemorrhagic strokes. So of course, if you're, you have a study like the UK Biobank or the Olaf Research Program that enrolls more than 500,000 participants, it's a little bit, uh, difficult to have the depth of phenotyping that will allow you to develop something specifically for each subtype of different of a stroke, for example. Uh, so that's kind of a cost uh, benefit thing that you have to decide here. Of course, another axe of the medical data is the longitudinal follow-up they have for the patient. Many of these studies um, are longitudinal, fortunately, uh, but we also we only in general have information for particular time points and not like continuous information about these patients. And also many of the studies are just cross-sectional. Uh, so that's something to take into account. Um, linkage refers to the idea that 
for multimodality in particular, we can have data from electronic health records, uh, and then we can have data from imaging that may be linked together by uh, an MRN number, but maybe we, we have genetic data that was done in 23andMe and it's not integrated into electronic health records. So there is no way for, for me to actually link that genetic data to that electronic health record data. Uh, so this is another thing that it's, it's, it's very tricky because many organizations have to collaborate together to actually develop the data set that we need to, to develop these this kind of models. So what we say in the, in the review and, and what we think is that the idea that we, we need as a society to develop probably legislation that would incentivize uh, the sharing of data across organizations. Uh, another thing that is related to what I was talking about is the standardization of the data. So there are many common data models that uh, are developed to try to standardize what we mean for different medical terms, but that of course are at the, at the same time obscures a bit uh, the information that we can gather from, um, from these patients. The heterogeneity refers to having a very uh, different diversity in the participants that are enrolled in the studies and the interactions uh, have to do to whether we enroll patients that are from different families or we enroll patients that are linked in some way by uh, like family related, for example. So these are the things that we, we look in healthcare data. And kind of to, to, to start to conclude, of course, another challenge is uh, privacy. Um, and we probably know more about this uh, than me, but there are many ways that we try to solve these privacy issues in, in healthcare, uh, including federated learning, homomorphic encryption, uh, differential privacy, and more recently also swarm learning. Um, so of course, as you can imagine, privacy is very important for, for medical data. So in the future, we probably want to start uh, taking more into account this, all these strategies that uh, are needed to actually uh, ensure that the information that we use from the patient uh, is not used for, for uh, the wrong intentions, uh, to say in, in, in a way. Um, also another way to, to go about this is to use edge computing more and more so we don't have to actually send the data to, to, to any place in, in general. Um, and there are many studies that show uh, that uh, using federated learning in combination for, with homomorphic encryption, for example, is feasible across organizations and um, uh, produces good results even better than just having a model trained in one organization and trying to generalize to another. So just to, to conclude, uh, what we think uh, and what we suggest in the paper is that multimodal data in medicine is a very promising area and something that needs to be studied further. Uh, we left a few uh, recommendations in, in, in the paper of what, what things uh, we should do. One of the things that we think are very important is to actually try to identify and formulate the problems that uh, multimodal data can actually add value over having just single modality, which because not all machine learning problems uh, actually need multimodal data. Maybe some uh, are, are just uh, fine with, for example, imaging data alone. Uh, it would be good to actually also have data to pre-train models uh, that can only then require fine tuning on limited level data that will of course help with many of these, these tasks. Uh, one particular thing that is, it, it's also will also be useful is to have to benchmark the effect of different model architectures and multimodal approaches with working with this high dimensional data. Uh, and one one type of data has not been explored a lot uh, for uh, with the eye in general. It's omics data, and I think there's a, a big opportunity there, especially with with newer architectures. 
And of course, the more data we collect, in particular, if we have this data linked, like image text, for example, from radiology reports, uh, the better that we can uh, do in the future. So of course, collecting pair data uh, is important. Uh, so with that said, um, that's all I had for today. And uh, thank you very much for listening. I'm happy to take any, any questions. Thank you so much, Julian, for the very thorough uh, review of biomedical AI, multimodal biomedical AI. Um, before we open the floor for questions, let's all give Julian a round of virtual applause. Thank you for the great talk. Thank you for the invitation. Is there any question from the audience? Um, yeah, I actually have a question about the digital twin. Um, mm -hmm. I found it's actually very interesting, the concept of digital twin, but I'm not very sure, like, um, you show a diagram, the at least figure, about um, the actual pro, uh, subject versus digital twin. So I wonder, like, uh, it, are we going to simulate the outcome of the digital twin or what, what, what's happening there in terms of the digital twin? Yeah, that, that's what's happening basically. The idea is that you train, so first you, of course, uh, collect and harmonize data from many different patients with a particular disease. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the idea is that you have a model that would generate a digital twin that will then be used as a control. So with each particular trial, basically you either um, give the intervention or not give the intervention. And the idea is that you will model how the patient will progress over time. So in, in this particular case, the AGL twins are used as controls. Mm -hmm. So basically you're, you're trying to generate a digital twin that is very similar to the, the patient that you're going to give the drug to, basically. Mm -hmm. And you want to see how the patient is going to progress. So yeah, the, the digital twin, basically you're trying to predict the outcomes or how the patient is going to, pro to progress. I see, um, so is, can I understand it as um, predicting the, like the counterfactual outcome of, of the actual patient? Yeah, um, yes. And, and and the model is like trend based on the real world data. Yeah. I see. Okay. Um, yeah, thanks. Is there yeah. any other This question? is like uh, oh, a, a similar fine. approach, but that doesn't use uh, any model is to, in clinical trials is to basically use historical, mm -hmm. uh, historical control. So you basically mm -hmm. use an observational study from before and yeah. see how the patients did. Uh, but in this case, you basically try to create a, uh, a digital model that will be very similar to a patient that you're going to give the, the medication or the mm -hmm. intervention to. I see, you got it. Thank you. Hi, Julia. I have a Hi. question. You have. Thank you for your talk. It's very comprehensive. And uh, so, so in the med, in the clinically, we're always talking about the cost and the benefits. So I believe multimodality is definitely will give as a more, much more benefit, but meanwhile, the cost may be higher. I wonder, is there any application that uh, has the, the, the gained so much benefit and, and also keep the cost as, uh, as normal? That's a, a, a very insightful comment and question. Um, so I think it's something that, that we'll have to look long-term, I would say. So probably yes, the, the the collection of the data right now is going to be more costly, but something that it's like, for example, for genetics data, that's what I, I work for uh, more. Like in the in the last 10, uh, 20 years, the, the cost of actually having someone genotype uh, has decreased in, in, uh, incredibly. So for example, if in the future we want to use genetic data plus clinical data plus imaging data to predict something, uh, it, it'll be much cheaper than uh, what it, it, it 
be now just because of the cost of genotyping. And of course, for, for genetics also, the, the thing is that for genetics, you only have to do this, this one in your life and you can keep the information uh, for entire lives. Uh, but of course, for other things like proteomics and metabolomics, et cetera, uh, that, that's not going to be the case, but the technologies are going to be developed more and more. And uh, what we think is it will, it will become much more cheaper uh, in the future to actually have information about this. And maybe, not sure, but maybe it's the, it will become kind of a regular thing that we do, like we do right now with, in many cases with different laboratories studies in, in medical practice. Um, I see. I mean, is there any application that recently that is needed for the, those multi-modality? Uh, uh, sorry, can, can you repeat the, the question? I mean, is there any clinical application such as we specify some disease or something that, uh, that it's a, it's a must for those uh, uh, multiple modality data to get a good predict, uh, accurate prediction. Because normally, currently, in the in the clinical application, most of us just uh, use them separately, and uh, the doctor will merge them together to get, get the diagnosis or the prognosis. But no one yet to, as my as my as as far as I know, no one uses it for those multi modality to make yeah. a comprehensive, yeah. Yeah, I think like right now, there's probably not a lot of uh, places where this is being used in, in, in clinical practice so far, um, but I think more and more we'll, we'll start to, to see this. Uh, so there are many, uh, not many, but there are some studies showing, for example, that using clinical data plus imaging data is better to predict some diseases like pulmonary embolism, for example, so I think that's something that we may start to 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 see in the future, uh, because it's something also that you can obtain relatively easily and, and build applications relatively easy, like using information from the electronic health record and uh, images. Uh, but it's of course going to be a little bit harder for things that are not still integrated into the uh, the electronic health record systems like genetics data. Uh, this is something that is like still in the early stages. Um, actually, like the, the, the mentor had ideal uh, works on, on. There are many like initiatives to try to integrate the genetic data into the electronic health record, but so far there's not like a very generalizable solution for this. Um, so it, so it's going it's going to be challenging at first, I think, uh, but. This is what we hope for. Thank you. Is there any other question? If not, let's thank uh, Julian again. Um, thank you everyone for joining us today. And uh, next week will be our last session for this quarter before we take a break for the winter holidays. So I'll see you uh, next Thursday. Thank you, Julian. Thank you for the invitation.